event of the evening. Hello and welcome to These Days Are Hours, a Happy Days podcast. I'm Peter. And I'm Joe. And today, we will be discussing Season 5, Episode 12, Requiem for a Mouth. Okay, Peter, tell us what happens in Requiem for a Mouth. We open with Richie, Potsy, and Ralph's band finishing playing a song at Arnold's, the night before a football game. I love, I love, I love my calendar girl. Richie calls up the college fullback, Rebel E. Lee, who is going to lead their team to victory tomorrow against Oshkosh. Later, as the party is winding down, Rebel's girlfriend Kitty tells him to go home and get some sleep, which Rebel does, since his coach tells him to be in bed by 10. Coach says you grow when you sleep. Then Kitty tries to broach the subject of them breaking up. Rebel takes it badly. What would you say if I started playing the field? I'd kill the field! Then kisses Kitty on the forehead and leaves. Ralph joins Kitty at her booth. They kiss, and Kitty says she tried to tell Rebel, but all he ever does is lift her up. Meanwhile, Richie and Potsy try to hit on nurses. So, uh, you girls are studying to be nurses, huh? Wanna play doctor? Until they notice Ralph and Kitty slow dancing. They take Ralph aside to talk, and warn him that Rebel used to wrestle alligators. Ralph isn't particularly worried, and returns to Kitty. Richie and Potsy go after the exiting nurses, and Rebel returns to see his girlfriend dancing with another man. He furiously confronts Ralph. And Kitty says she wants to stop dating Rebel and start dating Ralph. It's bigger than the both of us. He's bigger than all three of us. <laughs> Ralph tells her to go powder her nose. Once she's gone, Ralph begs Rebel not to hurt him. Rebel grabs him by the waist and pins him against the wall. So he's kind of hanging over Rebel. It's a weird pose, and as you have pointed out, it looks weirdly suggestive. Fonzie arrives and breaks up the one-sided fight. No, he's not going to kill you because there's no fight in here in Arnold. Then leaves for inspiration point with a gaggle of girls. Rebel tells Ralph that tomorrow after the game, he's going to turn Ralph's nose upside down. If it rains, I'll drown. At the Cunningham house the next night, the Cunninghams are having dinner as Fonzie tells them about the fraternity he started, Fonza Fonzarelli. Their pin has a motorcycle and a broken heart on it. Howard gathers everyone around the piano to practice their song for the Leopard Lodge sing-along contest. He's found the perfect one, though according to Joni, that's what he said last year, and they closed the curtain on them. They sing Down by the Old Mill Stream. Down by the Old Mill Stream. Stream. And are interrupted by a knock at the door. In come Potsy and Ralph, the latter of whom is wearing a heavy coat, a fake beard, and an eye patch. Ralph, terrified, tries to explain that Rebel is going to beat him up as the indifferent Cunninghams keep singing. Fonzie says he talked to Rebel about it. Ralph is overjoyed. Rebel's gonna wipe up the streets with me. No, he isn't. I spoke to him. He's not? Until Fonzie adds that Ralph is going to fight Rebel at the gym on Sunday. Ralph is once again horrified. Did you say gym? Fighting? Yeah. Help! Fonzie tries to give Ralph a pep talk. Now I ask you, are you a man or a mouse? I'm waiting. I'm thinking. It doesn't work, and Fonzie leaves. Marion is despondent over all this violence. She blames TV westerns. She takes Joni to go to Jenny Pickle's house before Joni can give Ralph Jenny's fighting advice. If you get into any trouble, Jenny Pickle says, give him a knee. Yeah, Joni! <laughs> Howard offers to show Ralph some boxing moves he learned in the army. Richie thinks Ralph should get to training instead. Howard identifies Rebel as a slugger on Ralph's description of him as Mount Rushmore with fists. Richie points out that Ralph, being smaller, will have an easier time dodging and weaving. See, you're, you're, you're small, but you're fast. You know, you can dance, bob, weave. A psyched up Ralph declares that he's not afraid of Rebel or anyone, and he might not even need training. Then when Marion comes back in, a startled Ralph leaps into Richie, Howard, and Posse's arms. That Sunday, Ralph is remarkably cheerful at the gym, something Richie comments on. Ralph says he's going to take a dive. I might even make it a swan dive. <laughs> Much to Richie's annoyance, Rebel arrives, and Ralph leans against the ropes of the boxing ring and makes a crack about seeing his parents at the zoo. Rebel's response is to shake the ropes, causing Ralph to be thrown off. Fonzie and a gaggle of girls show up. Fonzie joins Ralph in the ring and asks if he really wants to take a dive in front of his girlfriend. Ralph is fine with it. Kitty's not here. She's at the movies with Potsy. Fonzie insists that Ralph is going to fight like a man and wishes him luck. Ralph agrees to do it, but then he tells Richie he lied, and he'll worry about Fonzie later. I can only throw one fight at a time. Potsy and Kitty show up. Why would they be at the movies when they'd miss the fight? Richie has to stop Ralph from attacking Potsy, then has to tell Potsy to get out of the ring, when Potsy wants to sing the national anthem or Teen Angel. Ralph realizes he can't throw the fight in front of Kitty, and will have to actually fight. He tries to apologize to Rebel about the zoo joke, and adds, may the South rise again. Rebel does not accept his apology. The fight starts. Al is announcing, Ladies and gentlemen, 
I always wanted to do this. And Joni's at the bow. Ralph spends the entire fight running, dodging, and occasionally taking hits. At one point, he jumps into Rebel's arm so he can't hit Ralph. At another point, he keeps hiding behind Al before Al leaves the ring. And manages to hit Rebel twice from there. Then he somehow gets his hands on a stool and holds Rebel away the way a lion tamer would hold a lion away. In the last round, Rebel hits Ralph hard enough to knock him out. It looks as if Ralph is down for the count, but at the sound of Kitty saying his name, Ralph! Ralph! Ralph gets up, vowing to win for her. He takes her along with a flurry of punches and a couple of, look up there, gags. But Rebel ultimately wins in the end with one good bonk to Ralph's noggin. Richie, Fonzie, and Potsy lift Ralph off the ground, and Fonzie assures him he didn't lose because he didn't run away. He did good. Afterwards, everyone leaves for a post-match party as Ralph, Rebel, and Kitty stay behind. Ralph watches as Rebel and Kitty appear to reconcile. Ralph forlornly thinks he's lost the fight and Kitty, until Kitty herself joins him in the ring and explains she was saying goodbye to Rebel forever. Goodbye? Forever. Ralph and Kitty happily embrace. Back at the Cunningham house, Marion gets off the phone with Ralph's mother, Minnie. I'll give my love to Mickey. She remarks to Howard that she's happy that all this fighting business is over. And in her family, they solve their differences with arm wrestling. Howard finds the idea laughable. <laughs> so Marion challenges him to a bout, which he promptly wins. She invites Howard upstairs, but he's more interested in two out of three. Marion wins again. Thank you, Peter. That was Requiem for a Mouth, which first aired back on December 6, 1977. This was Happy Day's 100th episode. <laughs> Meaning the show was now a shoe-in for syndication. Happy Days had already been running as part of ABC's daytime schedule since way back in 1975. That night, Happy Days was the lead into a new Laverne and Shirley in which Shirley gets her appendix out. CBS countered with a new episode of The Fitzpatricks in which a young swimmer named Buddy has a mental breakdown after his father dies. And on NBC, The Man from Atlantis had an episode called The Naked Montague. And here is the actual plot summary. When a sea quake opens a fissure and Mark investigates, he finds himself in the world of Romeo and Juliet. Oh my god! Is The Man from Atlantis the greatest television show of all time? Because it kind of sounds like it. Every week, it sounds just amazing. So out of those three, what are you watching? I'm watching The Man from Atlantis! I have to know why there's an underwater Romeo and Juliet world, so yeah, I'm watching that too. Requiem for a Mouth was directed by Jerry Paris, and it was written by Steve Zacharias. This was the last of Steve's Happy Days script credits. He'd previously written A Shot in the Dark, The Deadly Dares, and They Shoot Fonzies, Don't They? As for guest stars this week, let's start with Audrey Landers as Kitty, an actress and singer from Philadelphia. Audrey has been appearing on TV since the early 1970s with occasional film roles. She's the older sister of Judy Landers, who just played Boom Boom last week. Audrey is probably best known for playing Afton Cooper for eight years on Dallas. I was frantic. I checked every place I could think of. Where have you been? I mean, I'm getting drunk. She's also had recurring roles on Somerset, High Cliff Manor, One Life to Live, The Hugabug Club. Brian, Kelly's iguana is friendly, but we understand if you don't want to go near him, it's okay. And Burn Notice, her films include A Chorus Line and 1941. So, Peter, what did you think of Audrey Landers as Kitty? She's really pretty. Like, really, really, really pretty. I absolutely get why Ralph would risk getting murdered by a large, possibly Confederate man for this woman, because, you know, I might too. She is extremely appealing, and you're right. There has to be someone extremely attractive and desirable in this for Ralph to risk all the injuries and all the pain that he's going to get in this fight with Rebel. And I think Audrey Landers plays that extremely well. I thought it was interesting that her sister was just on the show last week, and they don't comment on her looking just like Fonzie's girlfriend from a week ago. Do you think they're related in universe? No, I don't think so, because I think if they were, they would say, oh, how's Boom Boom? It's interesting to me that Kitty is allowed to speak and Boom Boom wasn't. Well, I mean, Boom Boom was just there for, like, set dressing. I, I, I don't like to phrase it that way because it's objectifying, but that's kind of what the show did, and... Kitty has an actual role in the plot. Yeah, she has a better character. She's actually given stuff to do and say. And she turns out to be a more complex character than maybe first thought. And she has agency. She's the one who breaks up with Rebel in the end. So that's nice. We also have my favorite, Reb Brown as Rebel E. Lee. Yes! Born- Born Robert Lee in Los Angeles, Reb was quite the athlete playing football at USC and boxing professionally. And, of course, he's been playing bulked-up muscle men in TV shows and films since the early 70s. MST3K fans will know him best as Dave Ryder from 1988 Space Mutiny. Fridge, large meats. Punt, speed junk. Butch, deadlift. He also played Captain America in two TV movies from the 1970s. I want you to remember something when you get out of jail, pal. The old people around here are my friends. And if I ever hear they have problems again, I'm coming after you. You got that? 
Reb's film credits include Uncommon Valor, Hardcore, and Earthquake. On the small screen, you could have seen him on Three's Company, Miami Vice, The Six Million Dollar Man, and so many other shows we can't even name them. So, Peter, what did you think of Reb Brown as Rebel E. Lee? I thought it was an interesting decision to make him comically Southern. His name is Rebel E. Lee, and he's from the Bayou, and he used to fight alligators. And at one point, Ralph made the South Rise Again joke. Yeah! Oh, the South's gonna rise again. Those are some interesting choices. It's basically just like, he's also kind of dumb. So that's an interesting choice. Well, Reb Brown does excel at playing those kind of, uh, let's say, less intellectual type characters, the more physical characters. I don't think he has any kind of real interior life. I don't imagine he has much of an agenda or anything other than playing football, kissing Kitty on the forehead, and beating the crap out of anybody who tries to come between him and Kitty. I admit that when I first realized he was played by Reb Brown, I was wondering, wait, is Reb short for Rebel? Are his parents Confederate sympathizers too? And then it turns out that no, he was from L.A., so I don't really know what's going on on that front. There's a lot to unpack with the real-life Reb Brown, but I think if you want to have a guy come in and just play a big, dumb muscle head, obviously Reb Brown is a perfect choice. I love what he brings to this episode, and I just love the visual of Donnie Most there in the ring, slugging away with this giant Reb Brown looking like Dolph Lundgren in Rocky IV. I must break you. Yeah, it's, it, it's a hilarious mismatch. As for songs this week, we have Calendar Girl perform at Anson Williams. It was the number four hit for Neil Sedaka in 1961. And Down by the Old Mill Stream, a pop song first written in 1910 by Tell Taylor. It has since become a favorite of barbershop quartets. Down by the Old Mill Stream. Although I didn't hear the Cunninghams doing too much harmonizing on it. They all just kind of sing the melody. Maybe that's why the curtain got closed on them last year. As for cultural and historical references, this episode's title is a reference to Rod Serling's boxing drama, Requiem for a Heavyweight, the tale of a washed-up boxer and his exploitative manager. It was originally performed on TV back in 1956 with Jack Palance and Keenan Wynn. Six years later, it was made into a film with Anthony Quinn and Jackie Gleason. Mm. Where are you? Where are you? I'm in Pittsburgh. It's raining... They're in New York, St. Christopher's Arena. New York. That's right, New York. The University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee fielded a varsity football team from 1899 to 1974, though the program struggled between 1956 and 1969 after the departure of head coach Herman Kluge. During the Kluge years, the university, which was then known as Milwaukee State, had an intense rivalry with Oshkosh State, hence the giant football with Beat Oshkosh at Arnold's. So that part is real. The college only became the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee in 1956. In 1959, under head coach Armin Kraft, Milwaukee went 4-4 four and four and finished in fifth place in their division. It was Kraft's most successful but final season as a coach. In their first season with Kraft as coach, they went 0-8. and eight. That year, the year this episode is taking place, Milwaukee routed Oshkosh by a score of 35-0. to zero. Obviously, Rebel E. Lee came through for him that Saturday. Potsy's nickname, the Velvet Cloud, Ladies and gentlemen, our own Velvet Cloud, Potsy Weber, is a reference to crooner Mel Torme, known as the Velvet Fog. And the Velvet Fog joins us this morning, Mr. Mel Torme. Good morning, Mel. Someday, my darling Eileen, somebody is going to billboard me and say hello to me and not say... Velvet, Velvet fog. fog. I almost crossed it out. <laughs> Torme was given that nickname in 1947 by a DJ named Fred Robbins. Mel hated it, but it stuck with him for the rest of his life. Aww. Reb Brown actually did play fullback at USC in 1967. In case you were wondering, he was about 30 years old when he made this episode. <laughs> Ralph refers to Potsy and Richie as the peanut gallery. I'm guessing he's referring to the studio audience at the Howdy Doody show. But that term goes back to the days of vaudeville, when the cheap seats were called the peanut gallery because the rowdy spectators would throw peanuts at the performers they didn't like. And of course, Richie was memorably a member of the peanut gallery in one episode of this show. He was. He was literally in the the peanut gallery. Joni suggests that Ralph sing Mammy. She's referring to My Mammy, a popular song written in 1918 by Walter Donaldson, Joe Young, and Sam Lewis. That song was originally performed by William Frawley, the actor best known as Fred Mertz on I Love Lucy. But in 1921, Al Jolson sang it as part of a Broadway show called Sinbad. It became his signature song. 
one he would be singing for the rest of his life, and he was known to perform it in blackface in a highly sentimental, emotional fashion, typically sinking to his knees for greater effect. Mammy. Mammy. Man, the early 20th century was a bad and racist time, as opposed was- to now when it's not bad and racist anymore. Thanks to Happy Days, we figured out all these problems and society's back on the right track. Coincidentally, the last time that Happy Days name-checked Mount Rushmore was last of the big-time mouths. Again, the Keystone South Dakota Monument measures 2,296 feet wide and 984 feet high. The monument was never actually completed, but funding ran out in 1941. Doesn't look finished to me. How do you mean? It looks like somebody got bored doing it. Washington's the only one with any clothes. They're just kind of roughed in. Lincoln doesn't even have an ear. Marion blames violence on TV westerns during the 1959-1960 TV season. The top three programs in America were all westerns. Gunsmoke, Wagon Train, and Have Gun Will Travel. Two of those have gun right in the name. Gunsmoke. Starring James Arness as Matt Dillon. The fight occurs at the Main Street Gym, located at 316 South Main, above a luggage store and next to a parking garage. There is no corresponding address to this in Milwaukee, but there is in Los Angeles. This is another case of the writers forgetting that they're not in the place where they're writing. I think this is a case of the writers putting in a fake location, again, so that Happy Days fans don't go to the real 316 South Main in Milwaukee and bother who's ever there. (laughs) Patsy offers to sing Teen Angel. Mark Dinning had a number one hit with this tragic ballad in February 1960. The single was released in October 1959, and it peaked a few months later. So this episode would be taking place right around the time that Teen Angel was taking off as a song. Have you heard that one, Teen Angel? Yeah, I can't say it's my favorite song about teenagers dying young. No, I had a whole album called The Best of Tragedy that just has all those songs from that era on one album. Oh, wow. That's amazing. It's so worth getting, and the cover is hilarious. They have a guy who's dressed up as the Fonz, <laughs> and, and he's given the double thumbs up while he's standing on a railroad track, <laughs> and there's a train coming right behind him, and he doesn't see it. Other observations. Is Richie not dating Lori Beth in this episode? He and Patsy seem to be hitting on those nurses pretty hard at Arnold's. Either what? that or Richie is a no-good two-timer and Lori Beth should leave him for someone else. Their relationship seemed to be rock solid before, but I don't know. Maybe they were on a break. We were on a break! This is another issue I had. Beat Oshkosh? What happened to Squash Oshkosh? That was the slogan from A Shot in the Dark. Maybe Rebel came up with this one. That would be the kind of slogan that Rebel would come up with. I wonder if any of those Fonz Fonzarelli buttons still exist. There seem to be a bunch of them visible in this episode. At least one of those must still exist somewhere in the world. Yeah, or if somebody listening wants to, like, make some and sell them on Etsy. I even made up our own pin. See that? It is a little motorcycle here on a broken heart. So we don't get any closure on the Leopard Lodge sing-along contest? No, we don't. Which is a shame because now I really want to see the Cunninghams crash and burn at the next sing-along. I kind of wanted it to be staged like the music contest near the end of The Sound of Music. (laughs) (laughs) Where they're all wearing later hosen and then they have to (laughs) escape out the side and all this kind of stuff. Oh, that would be so funny. Like like the performance goes really badly. And Fonzie's wearing his leather jacket over his later hosen. Oh, that would be even better. Someone in the audience actually hisses when Rebel steps into the ring. So if you watch this episode, listen for that. And here is where I misjudged Kitty. I said she was a more complex person than I had originally guessed. I honestly thought that Kitty was going to cheat on Ralph with Patsy. After all, she cheated on Rebel with Ralph, so what would keep her from cheating on Ralph with Patsy? But nothing like that happens. What actually happens between Ralph and Kitty is actually genuine, and she really is committed to this relationship, which begs the question, what happened to Kitty? Maybe she got erased from existence? Maybe she got sick of Ralph's unfunny crap? I guess so. It, it really seemed like they were setting up a more long-term character. Yeah, and it what... really did. I, I guess that's why this episode disappoints me a little, because you have Ralph going through something like character development when he decides to not be a coward and try to win for the woman he loves and you've got kitty breaking things up with her kind of scary kind of violent boyfriend so that she can be with ralph instead and then they just never see each other again they break up off screen i guess 
And what's even more confusing, in season six, he dates another girl named Kitty. They reused the jaunty adventure music from Fonzie's water skiing scene during the boxing match. Did you hear that? Yes, it was delightful. As soon as I heard that music, I was like, oh, I was back in California <laughs> watching Fonzie jump that shark again. So, Peter, were there any outstanding Happy Days fashions this week? No, not really. I have to point out one item of clothing that really did catch my eye, and it was Rebel's electric yellow sleeveless muscle shirt <laughs> that he wears at Arnold's. I thought that was a pretty incredible garment. Corn on the cob and tangerines. I like yellow things. I really did enjoy that shirt. It's an enjoyable shirt. So, Peter, I will ask that age-old, timeless question. Was this episode any good? Yeah, it was a fun little romp. It gave Ralph a bit of character development, which I think he needed, because a character like Ralph can get annoying very easily. So I think that this was good to give him some pathos, to give him something like a real soul, and I appreciated it. Me too. I thought this was one of Ralph's better spotlight episodes. We get, as you say, the pathos... And we also get plenty of slapstick. They get very cartoony during the fight with at one point, as you mentioned, Ralph acting like a lion tamer and uh, hiding behind Al and doing all this uh, wacky cartoon stuff. But then you see that there is really a human being behind all that clownish behavior. And I think Donnie Most plays that really well. The big disappointment, again, is that they didn't follow up on this. They just basically dropped this episode and forgot about it because Kitty does not become a recurring character. And Ralph, I'm guessing, probably just goes back to being a one-dimensional goofball next week. Mm -hmm. But I thought this was a really fun one. And something weird must be happening with me because I'm getting to the point where I'm starting to like the replacement music. <laughs> oh, no. Overall, I think Requiem for a Mouth is a lot of fun. And I would recommend that people watch it. it. I think it mixes things up, having a big part of the episode take place at a boxing arena. And yeah, I think this was a fun one. So, Peter, how can people keep up with us and find out about all the wonderful things that we are doing? Listeners can follow us on Twitter at Fonzie Podcast. They can follow me on Twitter at Peter Volfrank. That's P-E-T-E-R-V-U-L-F-R-A-N-N-C. And they can follow me on Twitter at Joe underscore A underscore Blevins. They can find this podcast online at thesedaysareours.libsyn.com. And they can email us with questions, comments, and concerns at thesedaysareourspodcast at gmail.com. So, Peter, what do we have on the docket for next week? Next week, Richie tries to get better at journalism by uncovering a conspiracy in Nose for News. I'm intrigued already, so see you later, alligator. In a while, crocodile. Teen Angel, Teen Angel, Teen Angel. That fateful night, the car was stalled upon the railroad track. I pulled you out and we were saved, but you went running back. Goodbye. Forever. <laughs>